Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to EduSide live lectures. Dear friends, today in science we will be discussing about proteins and essentially we will be talking about the amino acids, polypeptides and proteins. To discuss this topic we have with us our subject expert Dr. Unnati Gulati. Dr. Gulati is academic coordinator in consortium for educational communications Delhi. Without further ado, I would like to welcome ma'am to our studios and request her to start the lecture. Welcome ma'am. Thank you Amrit. Welcome students to this EduSat Live lecture. Uh, this lecture is the introductory to the first, uh, to the series of lectures where we will be talking about proteins. This lecture is uh, talking about the building blocks. We will talk about the amino acids and how, what are the chemical properties they show that give rise to the structure and function of the proteins. Uh, this is uh, the objectives for today's lecture would be what are the proteins made of, what is the nomenclature and classification of amino acids, what are the acid base properties by virtue of the functional groups in the, protein, in the amino acids and what are the propensities of amino acids that they prefer certain kind of secondary structures namely the beta uh, sheets, alpha helices and the turns. And when we think about proteins, the word protein comes from the Greek word proteos which is the first one and protein being the uh, molecule of life because it is the most abundant, it is very relevant, it is the most important for carrying out all types of functions in the uh, living systems. And what importantly we will uh, like to know is what is the structure of the protein and we will try to take a microscopic view into the protein structure which as uh, shown here is a big uh, globule of uh, uh, molecules. How are they arranged? What are the uh, strings on a bead that we talk about is the primary structure? Do we actually have them as uh, near nice pearls on a bead and are these pearls just round? Uh, structures, do not they have any uh, disruptive or uh, do not they have any other characteristic in terms of their R groups. So, this is what we are seeing in this slide that we can have R groups of various sizes and what these R groups will lend the property to the protein we will see in this lecture. So, how we go from an unknown structure looking at it microscopically and we finally have some uh, R groups that favor some secondary, uh, secondary structures that eventually form the tertiary structure or the functional structure of the protein. So, in the proteins the primary structure comprises of the sequence of amino acids that are present and this sequence of amino acid is bound together in a covalent bond which is called the peptide bond. In this lecture we will look at the structure and properties of that. Then the next level, the next hierarchy of protein structure is the secondary structure. This is again the primary, the sequence of amino acids folding onto itself, forming hydrogen bonds and giving rise to three, uh, three main uh, characteristic structures, the helices, strands or sheets and the turns and the loops. So, uh, then the secondary structure also has to fit into a larger uh, global, global structure and that is the tertiary structure. The main interactions in the tertiary structure will be the weak interactions and key interaction out of these weak interactions will be hydrophobicity and tertiary structure will see how the secondary structure is eventually placed in the, uh, placed in the protein. Mostly you will find the secondary structure to lie on the surface of the protein and the hydrophobicity uh, elements or hydrophobic elements are residing in the core of the protein. So, this is the three levels and beyond this we can have the quaternary structure where we have tertiary structure uh, elements which combine or which undergo interactions hydro, uh, hydrogen bonding or uh, weak interactions to give rise to a quaternary structure which comprises of not just one peptide, not just one polypeptide but several polypeptides. So, what is the primary structure? So, the primary structure is the amino acid sequence 
and there is a direction, uh, directionality to the primary structure, you will have an N terminus and C terminus of the protein. So, where does this N and C terminus of the protein come from? This also is the property of the amino acid which is the building block for the protein. So, we can see that here we have a NH3 group followed by valine, uh, phenylalanine and on uh, so, uh, and such amino acids and ending with the COO minus the carboxylate group. So, this is telling us that you start with the N terminal which is having the amide group and all the amino acids the sequence follows. The sequence is a very relevant, uh, very relevant component to the final secondary and tertiary structure. We cannot have this uh, a protein primary structure if we disrupt the second, uh, if we disrupt the amino acid sequence. If we change the amino acid sequence, we will end up with the entirely different protein. So these things we will take up when we talk about protein folding. So, protein primary structure itself is not bound by how many amino acid residues will eventually form an, uh, a polypeptide or a protein. There could be 20 amino acids which can form the smallest protein which is the TRP cage and then you have 27,000 amino acids joined in a sequence one after the other in the molecule titan. Titan it's, uh, it is a protein, fibrous protein found in the muscles. If you are aware about actin and myosin and uh, titan, so this is important for muscle contraction. Also, it is important when chromosomes are undergoing mitosis. So, there also how does the chromosomes move towards the centriole is also uh, guided by the titan molecule. So, this being the largest and you have the smallest. But then functionality does not depends on the number of amino acids alone. As you can see a small dipeptide which is commonly known as aspartame, L-aspartyle, L-phenylalanine, methyl ester which is the artificial sweetener also it is a dipeptide and it is a functional molecule but I will not call it as a protein. So, we can say that the structure, uh, so that we can say that there are several types and functions of proteins. Proteins are as we say the workhorses, they are the soldiers, they have the function of protecting the body, they provide immunity. They are able to catalyze chemical reaction, they are synthesizing the D and repairing DNA molecule. Transport across membranes is also facilitated by proteins and signaling within the cell and uh, intercellular uh, uh, signaling is uh, carried out by proteins. Also we respond to stimuli uh, or with the help of proteins and definitely we know that our muscles are made up of proteins and they provide lot of structural support. Also our blood has a very important component hemoglobin which is a protein and it is a carrier of oxygen. So, we can see there are varied functions of proteins and they are you think of it and there is going to be a protein to do that function. So, uh, so we can say that there is quite a variation in the amino acid residues that will result in a protein. You need not have a set number of amino acids to make to make it as a functional protein. So, smallest we start with was is uh, cytochrome C and we can see there is a list that goes till titan which is the largest of the uh, protein in terms of uh, size in term of number of amino acid residues. So, we can say in the amine in the uh, proteins most important thing is the structure will determine what function is the protein going to take up. The structure will be the primary structure which is the utmost important one determined by the sequential addition of the amino acid residues that will de defi uh, define how will the polypeptide once formed eventually assembles to give you a secondary structure. Once the secondary structure is formed, the beta sheets alpha helices and to further form a more compact structure, they may undergo, they may have turns and random loops. So, they will cause the folding and compaction of the protein further. 
once the polypeptide is further compact it will undergo tertiary inter tertiary structure formation by induction of uh, by by the help of the various weak interactive forces that occur and eventually we come to the packing of the protein again tertiary structure some proteins may be just a single polypeptide but some uh, some proteins have several such subunits each containing one polypeptide and they undergo a quaternary arrangement so we are looking at the structural hierarchy starting from the amino acid one residue undergoing peptide bond formation giving rise to the primary sequence which is responsible for the secondary structure formation and the secondary structure once it undergoes folding it will try to bring in the hydrophobic residues towards the core and we result in the tertiary structure so first let's look at the amino acid which is the topic for today so the amino acid is a organic molecule having two functional groups it is having one amino group and one carboxyl group apart from that both these groups are attached to the c c atom or the carbon atom which we name as the c alpha and this c alpha can is also uh, because carbon has four uh, uh, valency it will try to have one uh, hydrogen and the other group is free which is replaceable in all the amino acids and this is the r group so in a standard amino acid you will have one amino group one carboxyl group one hydrogen and one r group which is replaceable so uh, we have the c alpha c and c alpha n which are the backbone atoms and r we will see how it varies and what uh, what properties does it impart to the protein once uh, polypeptide is formed a very important property we encounter with amino acids because of its structure that there are uh, there is one central atom and around which you have four groups namely the four groups one of them is the amide group carboxyl group hydrogen and the r group so taking uh, so taking the view from l glyceraldehyde or d glyceraldehyde fisher talked about isomerism which is stereoisomerism that we encounter in organic molecules this kind of isomerism talks about rotate uh, talks about how the functional groups are arranged around a central atom the organic compound can be levo or dextro rotatory the amino acid that we encounter in humans generally mostly in our proteins are going to be predominantly l amino acids while the sugars that we encounter generally are d amino acids uh, sorry d glu, uh, d sugars so dextro rotatory glucose etc you will find more predominantly so we can say there is a predominance of l amino acids within organic all the living system except a few bacteria and except a few cases where there may be a post translational modification you also encounter d amino acids in uh, bactericidal peptides and this these uh, d forms are known to be uh, microcidal or they prevent life from going on once they are present there so we can see that we have amino acid l and d form once we go from the coo to the r group to the n group we go clockwise once we are going clockwise we call it as the corn which is the levo rotatory form if we have to go anti clockwise we call it as the dextro rotatory form this property is called the property of chirality which is encountered in enantiomers so as we were talking about if we have a central atom here the central component is the c alpha h you keep the c uh, c alpha on the plane of the page and you can keep the hydrogen either behind or in front of you 
once uh, you can see from this diagram also the hydrogen is dark so that means it is in front c alpha h bond we are looking this is in the plane of paper rest all the groups are arranged around it so we get the property of chirality this is called the handedness of the um, uh, amino acid so we can have mirror image of the amino acids the l and the d form and these are non superimposable so we have to determine the l and d form and the simple test as we discussed was if we keep the hydrogen and c alpha bond in the plane of paper and we start uh, start clockwise or anti clockwise but we search for the cooh then r then n so if we are able to get the acronym corn it becomes a uh, in the anti clockwise direction it will be uh, l isomer if it is in the clockwise direction it will be d isomer so this is again what we are seeing so so when we talk about amino acids let's uh, briefly see where they were first discovered so the first amino acid discovered was asparagine from asparagus vegetable then glutamate is obtained from wheat gluten tyrosine which is derived from cheese and hence the name so the naming of the um, of these amino acids we don't talk about them as their chemical names but we talk about their generic names and glycine for sweet so proteins can contain several amino acid derivatives and these derivatives um, can have original amino acid or they can be chemically modified and many such amino acids are present apart from the 20 that we are going to discuss now so we will talk about uh, epinephrine which is derived from tyrosine and uh, we can talk about 4 hydroxy uh, proline and 4 hydroxy lysine that are modified uh, from proline and lysine respectively and they become part of collagen and they become part of uh, proteins in the some of the plants so these modifications they occur and these are uh, encountered other than these are unusual encountering that we find of amino acid structures so introducing the 20 amino acids we have the r group as we had discussed apart from the c alpha and the ch uh, the co minus and nh3 plus group we have the r group and this variation in r group gives us the 20 co common amino acids that we will talk about you will find all the proteins being formed of these 20 amino acids so we have them classified according to the r group r group can be hydrophobic it could be hydrophobic by having a long aliphatic chain or it may be an aromatic group it the r group can be hydrophilic water loving it can be polar hydrophilic it can be alcoholic with an oh or it can be charged such as nh3 or nh2 and you can also have some r groups having special sulfur uh, sulfurs or you can have a amino acid which is glycine which does not have any special r group but it has a hydrogen so we can say glycine is one example which is not going to have an enantiomer rest all amino acids will show enantiomers in the l and d form so also another way of characterizing amino acids is are they essential or uh, can we form them in the body by its uh, by ourselves or do we need to supplement it through nutritional uh, in uptake some of the essential or indispensable amino acids are phenylalanine valine threonine tryptophan methionine leucine isoleucine lysine and histidine so we have a small acronym to remember essential amino acids then certain amino acids can have very uh, very stringent physiological need based uh, requirement such as in infants some amino acids such as histidine may not be present we need 
under certain disease conditions also we may not be able to synthesize arginine cysteine glycine glutamine proline and tyrosine and these need to be supplemented from food some of them are dispensable they are alanine aspartic acid asparagine and glutamic acid and serine so we are able to synthesize them and hence we don't need to uptake it from food a very uh, the experiment that led to this kind of uh, uh, characterization or classification of amino acid was done by uh, wc rose who studied rats and he gave them a diet of uh, wheat wheat uh, of uh, maize and maize fed right rats showed a lot of uh, morbidity once this diet was replaced with whey which is a uh, protein derived from milk the rats recovered so he di- he did lot of studies by replacing each of the amino acids he was able to find that which of the amino acids are essential and which of them are not essential so another way of characterizing the property of amino acids and we would like to do it by their chemical nature is through their hydrophobicity size charge secondary structure preference and aromaticity also we have special cases of cysteine which contains sulfur and also forms the bridges another amino acid which contains sulfur is serine but it does not forms a which is a methionine which does not form any bridges so uh, here we will take reference of dr margaret oakley dayhoff uh, she can be considered as the father of bioinformatics uh, well we will not say father we will say uh, the mother or founder of the field of bioinformatics and the single letter code can be attributed to her because the need for reducing the data size we all know that we uh, have a three letter code for the amino acids and we have a single alphabet code for amino acids so the three letter codes are the first three letters of the uh, amino acid but to simplify the data in the age where we, they didn't have supercomputers they tried to minimize the data so they gave single letter code and this is uh, a classification based on that this will also help us in learning the single letter code for all the amino acids so very simply in these amino acids you can simply take the first letter and it will be the single letter code for these amino acids we are again taking the single letters and we are going to use them as the code here in case of arginine we are using the r in phenylalanine the phenetic is f in tyrosine the y and in tryptophan it is w similarly in case of uh, easy to remember all these aspartic acid asparagine definitely they sound so much alike we have to remember by aspartic acid so there is d asparagine and n is predominant here glutamic and glutamine so we have e for glutamic acid and glutamine is q and then we have lysine lysine is uh, uh very uh, we should have had l but it is k because k is the nearest letter in the alphabet and whenever uh, a key thing is whenever there is amine like glutamine in the name then there has to be an amide and if there is an eight in the name then there is has to be a carboxylate so we can go here so glutamate would be a carboxylate and glutamine will be a amine group so the second way we can characterize uh, the chemical nature of amino acids is by their r groups the r groups there can be non polar hydrocarbons which are uh, long chain or may have one of the sulfur containing amino acids 
the predominant forces here are dispersion forces which we know as the London dispersion forces arising from polar dipolar uh, interactions occurring in the molecule uh, in the molecule the other forces are hydrophobic effects and these non-polar amino acids do not form hydrogen bond then we have polar but uncharged amino acids which can hydrogen bond with water and with other amino acids then we have acidic or we can say they have a carboxylic acid functional group which has a negative charge at pH 7 and they are freely hydrogen bond with water they show ionic interactions and they also participate as nucleophiles in acid base reactions that are very important during enzyme catalysis if we have acids we also have basic which are positively charged when at neutral pH and you will encounter guanido group, imidazole group and amine group containing amino acids in this category and they serve as proton donors because they have one excess H plus and they also uh, show ionic interactions and they are also very important in the active sites of, pro of uh, proteins that work as enzymes. So first look at the category of non-polar but neutral uh, we look the structure of uh, tryptophan phenylalanine and glycine then non-polar aliphatic which are having long chain carbon so alanine valine and isoleucine so again we have another three in that leucine methionine which is non-polar because uh, sulfur here is non-polar and we have proline here there is cyclization that has occurred so the NH is not free here we have hydrophilic polar but neutral so they are hydrophilic because of the presence of OH group they are polar also but they do not get uh, ionized and they are neutral so these polar uncharged R groups we encounter our serine, threonine, cysteine, asparagine and glutamine and cysteine as we were discussing is a weak acid and it will form weak hydrogen bonds with oxygen and nitrogen and that of asparagine and glutamine they have amide groups and cysteine also shows the bridge formation the disulfide bridge formation we also have hydrophobic polar neutral uh, amino acids which are polar but neutral uh, polar because of the NH2 and CO in the R group so glutamine cysteine are in this category the basic ones which are positively charged at this pH because of their secondary primary amino group or the positively charged guanidium group or the imidazole ring which is occurring here then we have the negatively charged amino acids at pH 7 they are the acidic ones they can accept a proton so the proton acceptors here are aspartic acid and glutamic acid so the key points after this this classification is that all amino acids need not fall into these same classes there can be different combinations and more importantly we will see later that these properties of the residues also depend on what environment these amino acids are present in so to summarize this we have the 20 amino acids characterized on the basis of the R groups and we will see there are so many variations in the R group from aliphatic to aromatic to uh, non-polar so a brief uh, view on this slide <laughs>
In this section, we will talk about a very important property of amino acids, which is their ionizing behavior. Amino acids are comprising of the amino group and the carboxyl group. If we think of any molecule which is having an NH3 plus group and any molecule which is having the CO minus group, these will show acid and base like property behaviors. And if we are talking about it as an acid and base, we can cause its deprotonation or protonation. Also as other acids and base, we can also titrate them. Like in any acid and base, we can find its ionization constant. So, what are those properties and can we apply them to amino acids? We will see in this section. So, amino acids when we look at it, it is containing both the uh, NH3 plus and COO minus groups uh, in their ionized forms. When both these, both these moieties are present on an amino acid, it imparts it a net negative charge. We are talking about an amino acid which does not have an R group. We are only talking about a, a, a glycine like amino acid which is having only the N and the C terminal, uh, N and the C group. So when we dissolve such an amino acid such as glycine into water at pH 7, it will show behave as a dipolar ion or in German language it is called having being the Zweiter ion. This is then amphoteric because it is having a dual characteristic as an acid and a base being a proton acceptor and a proton donor. So a proton donor will make it an acid and proton acceptor as a base. So which of the groups can accept a proton? The CO minus group can accept a proton. The neutral zwitterionic form means that the amino acid has lost its carboxylic acid proton and it has, it has become COO minus and the amino group is protonated and thus if the net charge is 1 plus and 1 minus which is 0 and hence this amino acid becomes net neutral. But when we say all the other 20 amino acids and as we know that the 20 amino acids have R groups. And these R groups have various uh, side chains, uh, side chain uh, ions. These ions can also protonate or take up a proton when in solution. So there are going to be 2 plus 1 pK values for any amino acid other than glycine. So the 2 pKs, 1 will be for the NH amino group, 1 will be for the CO H group and the additional ones and there will be varied for the R side groups or the uh, side chains. So this is an example of the simplest amino acid alanine. It is having the R group as CH3. Alanine is going to behave as diprotic because the functional group R is not going to ionize and in a diprotic acid we will encounter two curves one after the other. So one deflection is at the pK1 and one other deflection is at the pK2. These two, these two correspond to the dissociation, uh, deprotonation of the COO minus group and of the NH3 plus group. So let us look at this graph. We have the pH on the x -ax on the y axis and equivalence of OH on the x axis. Here we are looking at low pH, you can observe that there is NH3 plus and COOH, both the groups are present. Once we titrate it by addition of NaOH, you will encounter that first thing the proton from CO minus has been lost, it has deprotonated because the pKa of the COH group is 2.3. So as we go beyond the pH 2.3, the COH group tends to deprotonate. When we further add more NaOH 
and the pH becomes very high see around, uh, around pH uh, 10 we will see here even the NH3 plus has lost its proton and it has become NH2. So, the net charge here you are observing is only because of the negative charge on the oxygen of carboxyl group. What we observe from here is that both the uh, protonation uh, deprotonations do not occur simultaneously. The pKa of one group which is carboxyl is much lower and pKa of the amide group is much higher. So, it is at the uh, alkaline end of the pH scale. So, this tells us that around the pH 7 we will come to a point where carboxyl group has eliminated has given away one elect one uh, proton and the net charge here is 0. So, this is the Zwitter ionic uh, this is the Zwitter ionic state which corresponds to the pi or we call it as the isoelectric point or isoelectric pH. We will see in details what is isoelectric pH. But first let us discuss about why when we talk about free amine groups like in methylamine or free acetic acid such as uh, here do they have pK equivalent to 2.3 and 9 or is there any difference once both these groups are occurring simultaneously on the carbon uh, atom C alpha. So, the property of acetic acid and methylamine once they are occurring on the C alpha changes slightly because we have COH group which is electronegative and it will pull all the electrons towards it. So, once it pulls electrons towards it the ease of releasing, elect releasing the protons because you have taken away all the electrons now the proton a positive charge is not much attracted towards the amide group and it will be released easily or it becomes easier to release the proton from the amide group as well. So, that is what we see here in the di in this uh, we see in glycine that the COH group deprotonates at much lower pH. So, pKa for the carboxyl group in glycine is around 2.3 while free acetic acid has a pK about 4.8. So, there is about a 100 times ease of uh, deprotonation at once the, the acetic acid group is present in a amino acid. Similarly, the case of uh, NH2 group in the glycine here earlier you would encounter the methylamine to uh, deprotonate at a pH of 10.6, but now it is deprotonating at 9.6 when we are talking about the same methylamine group in the glycine. So, we can say that even though we have an amino acid which is having a uniform uh, N and C N C terminal, but the, their uh, pKa value can vary slightly because of the presence of the C group and, uh, and the R, function, R uh, functional group. So, we will see that these pK values will change and also the third component and the third pK we have to encounter is that of the R functional group. So, we will look at those, uh, but first let us think about other amino acids and what does these titrations as we were discussing by addition of uh, NaOH. So, the titration curves tell us that at the midpoint of the titration the point of inflection is reached where the pH is equal to the pKa of the protonated group being titrated and pK is the measurement of tendency of a group to give up a proton and as we just discussed the tendency may change when both the functional groups both the uh, groups are present on the C alpha. So, the tendency is uh, 10 folds as the pK increases by 1 unit and because these amino acids are showing uh, 2 pKs and we know that a buffer may act as a good uh, buffer 
to the range of one unit above and below its peak a uh, below its peak a so amino acids having two pks can act as very good buffers and uh, all amino acids with a single a amino group single carboxylic group and a non ionizable r group will resemble glycine titration curve so now you will be thinking about aromatic non polar uh, and aliphatic uh, uh, um, amino acids which do not have a r group having either an nh plus or an oh minus so we can quantitatively measure the pk of each of the ionizing groups and we have found that it is 2.3 for the coh and 9.6 for the nh group and carboxyl group is 100 times more acidic as discussed and pk is also affected by the environment and the r groups that are attached so also from the titration curves we can say that this tells about what will be the net charge and what will be the charge on the amino acids if you change the ph of the solution so we were talking about isoelectric point and isoelectric point is an important component even for amino acids which are freely present but more importantly isoelectric point is a property which will be immensely important when we talk about adding all the amino acids end to end in a pe peptide bond and forming a polypeptide so what you will have in the end result you will have one free end group followed by an amino acid then a peptide amino acid residue then a peptide bond and another amino acid residue and a peptide bond and this way the sequence will go on and you will end up with one co minus so you will have one free and one co minus group we have discussed about all the amino acids and each one we are seeing that it is showing a pk of 2 and pk of 9 but in the total protein you only have two free uh, n and c groups so do they really add up to the uh, isoelectric point no we will be looking at the r groups and we will look at the ionization that occurs at the r groups and how it is responsible in giving the net charge to the protein so ionizing isoelectric point is the point when we will talk about titration of all ionizable groups occurring in the r group and as we have discussed only the r groups are freely available to be ionized in a polypeptide then we will talk about the characteristic ph at which the net electric charge is going to be zero here the ph uh, will be at that point where net electric charge over all the r groups some may be positively charged some may be negatively charged and each of them will cancel and gives rise to neutral a uh, net uh, zero charge so also we will remember that amino acids which has a net negative charge at any ph above its pi and amino acids will have a net positive charge at any ph below its pi so this two points will help us uh, help us to determine the charge on the r groups when we are talking about amino acids in a polypeptide so this is a simple example of lysine having an r group with nh3 plus and how does it titrate we know that uh, the nh3 plus group titrates around 9.6 to 10 so this group will also titrate around that point and hence you can see the P pi is residing very much uh, closer to the pk2 and the pk3 so the pk2 was from the uh, nh3 plus group of the uh, amino acid and the pk3 is from the nh3 plus group of the r group so somewhere in between will reside the pi similarly is the case of histidine having an ionizable uh, r group which is the imidazole ring and here also we will see how the nh plus group on the ring is getting ionized as we reach the ph of 9.3 and hence we are seeing that there are three curves in this uh, three points of inflection in this uh, amino acid titration curve so you can study more such amino acids and look at examples of amino acids with 
uh, titrated uh, ionizable uh, R groups. Also look at examples of amino acids with non-polar, non-ionizable groups as well. But the story becomes slightly different when we are going to talk about ionization of peptides. Peptides are amino acids joined end to end in a, uh, in a peptide bond, but with free R groups. The free R groups are free to ionize and they will be the ones that actually uh, face the pH of the solution. So, it will be a good exercise to study how uh, take a random uh, polypeptide sequences and do a, a do uh, ionization of each of the residues and find the net charge and also find the pi so to help you in that we have this table in which the pkas of the r groups are characteristically given you not need not worry much about the pk1 and pk2 of the carboxylate and amide group but think about the R groups and as you can see some of them are not having the values. So, we know these are those which will not be ionizing. So, we can uh, assign these values and as we had discussed an amino acid will show positive charge once the uh, pK is when is uh, up when the pH is above its pi. So, using that we can find the amino uh, the charge on the amino acids of a polypeptide and we will also have to encounter for those uh, groups which are lying at the end of the N and the C terminal of the polypeptide. This property is very important and it is used in, uh, in isoelectric focusing. Isoelectric focusing is a technique we will discuss in more details, but this technique is talking about the point where the whole peptide becomes net neutral charge. So, if a peptide is charged it will move to either of the anode or the cathode end, but once it attains that pH where both the positive and ne negatively groups are going to cancel each other there will be zero mobility or no mobility and it will become statically placed on the, uh, on the medium it may be paper or it may be a gel. So, this can be used for separating amino acids on the basis of charge. This can be applied once to the polypeptide can be also applied to large proteins and we can uh, separate the proteins on the basis of the net charge. So, this is uh, shown in the second diagram. We will discuss this uh, in more details. Also, the charge on the amino acid uh, side chain determines the charge on the protein. This property can also be used for separation of proteins when we do ion exchange chromatography. So, we are looking at two ways by which you can separate and purify proteins on the basis of this chemical nature of titratability of amino acid R groups. So, let us talk about another property of uh, amino acids which is the peptide bond formation. Amino acids undergo peptide bond formation which is a type of condensation reaction here and as you can see the uh, carboxyl group of first amino acid reacts with the amine group hydrogen of the second amino acid giving rise to a peptide bond and releasing water. So, releasing water will tell you that it is a, a condensation type of reaction and the peptide bond shows a resonance structure and we will talk about its properties that it is planar and it has torsional angles. So, the peptide bond is not a, sim a simple single or a double bond. As we can see from here, Lennis Pauling was the first one to determine that the double bond like character is due to the resonance form of the amide in the peptide bond. So, Typically, you will encounter a CN bond to be only 1.47 angstrom while a double bond is 1.27 angstrom, but a, polyp a peptide bond is somewhere in between. So, the CO to NH bond is 1.33 angstrom which is roughly the average of a double and a single bond. So, a single bond shows free rotation around, around the bond while a double bond shows 
restricted or entirely no rotation around it bond. But what happens in the case of a peptide bond and how does this rotation or this planarity helps in further structure, determ uh, for structure formation. So, we are seeing that this is the structure of uh, amino acid which has undergone polypeptide, uh, polypeptide which is having the peptide bonds. As we can see the dotted areas are telling us about the planar CONH groups. There is a partial double bond because of the electronegative of the oxygen and this is a double bond and this lends it the rigidity. So, so this rigidity we can uh, say will prevent flexibility in the molecule. So, there is going to be no rotation about it. This will also tell us about that these free NC and C alpha, N C alpha, the two bonds, the C alpha O and C and C alpha N, these two bonds are where you will find maximum rotation. So, these will be important for uh, understanding secondary structure formation. So, what we come to know from the primary structure is that it is linear ordered, it is one dimensional sequence and it is written from the amino terminal end to the carboxylic end and that is the direction of the amino acid. If you reverse the direction, the, it becomes an entirely different protein. And unfolded extended polymer is unfavorable energetically compared to having a free amino acid. So, why do we prefer to have a polypeptide when only free amino acids would be formed and what is the compensation that occurs we will study. So, apart from the relationship which amino acids apart uh, impart to the chemical nature of the protein, they also have a lot of role to play in the structural component. We were talking about the alpha helix and the uh, beta sheets and turn. So, do the amino acids have a preference? Now that we have seen some of them have very long uh, R groups, aliphatic chain, some of them have bulky uh, aromatic groups. So, do they these uh, structural uh, differences give them certain uh, preferences for structure? So, in this diagram we can see the relative propensity. So, some of them are preferably found in alpha helix, some of them are not found in uh, alpha helix and they occur mostly in the beta sheet and some of them occur in bends. But as you can see, uh, there is no clear cut or hard and fast uh, rule uh, over that. They may be uh, present in both the alpha helix and beta sheet. So, uh, these are the some of the secondary structure uh, preferences we will talk about. So, the secondary structure for helices, we will encounter that uh, alanine, methionine, glutamine, and leucine and lysine, they prefer to be in alpha helices and uh, because they do not have very bulky side chains and they are hydrophobic, they prefer to be in alpha helices and uh, in, the, in the strands or beta sheets, you will encounter mostly valine, isoleucine, threonine, tryptophan. Uh, tyrosine and phenylalanine and this is because of their uh, hydrophobic and bulky groups and uh, uh, and in turns you will encounter mostly proline, serine, aspartate, uh, uh, asparagine and glycine. So, what is the status of proline and glycine? These two amino acids are not very good in forming alpha helices, they are rather called the alpha helix breakers because in glycine there is first thing there is no other functional group and this uh, causes lots of unconstrained movement which is not a very good thing when we are forming a secondary structure. We will discuss with the help of Ramachandran plot and also we do not uh, want proline in our alpha helix or in uh, beta sheets because proline is a uh, alpha helix breaker because it does not have a free NH plus uh, group that can form hydrogen bonding. 
also prolines you will not encounter in beta sheets because the angle which we will see the angle of uh, rotation is limited to uh, minus 60 to plus 25 and in beta sheets generally you will encounter minus 20 to 140 degrees. So, we can say uh, we can say by looking at this uh, diagram of the uh, Ramachandran plot that there are areas which are more predominantly where beta sheets are going to occur. So, you can see the angles so areas where more you will encounter left handed or right handed helices. So, these propensities are based on the torsion angles in the peptide bond. We will discuss them further how these torsion angles and what are these torsion angles once we do the Ramachandran plot. And uh, basically till now we have uh, we have uh, studied in this lecture that what are the chemical properties of amino acids in terms of the titration, in terms of the uh, R groups which, which impart a net charge to the protein. Also we have talked about what are the propensities of amino acids towards certain secondary structures. Uh, also we have talked about that they can be essential or non-essential or, or they could be uh, synthesized or not synthesized by the organism. So, these are three basic ways we have discussed and classified amino acids and we have taken a holistic view of uh, what amino acids can do in terms of their chemical structure and what they can do in terms of structure of the entire protein and function in terms of when we were talking about uh, the ionizable groups being part of the active sites in the enzyme. So, it gives us a brief idea about amino acids. Uh, I hope uh, you have been able to uh, understand all the properties of uh, amino acids with, uh, with this uh, lecture and uh, uh, we will carry forward and understand more about the peptide bond in terms of the structure and we will take up the structures in detail in our coming up lectures. Uh, on that note, I would like to thank ma'am for this very enriching discussion and I would like to thank you dear friends for watching our show. Stay tuned and keep watching. Thank you.